image and over, and what's that next word? His mark, over his mark. Right, they stood on the sea of glass having the harps of God. God is going to have people that get the victory over the beast, over the image, and over, it says, his mark. And that again tells us that the mark of the beast is not just some, some mark that's isolated over here, disconnected uh, on its own, that happens at the end times, but the mark is connected to this power called the beast. It is his mark. Got that? That's important. It is his mark. So that's why it's important to understand who he is. Are you with me? Who, who is he? Now, the Bible describes in chapter 13, verse 1 and verse 2, it describes this beast as a seven-headed, ten-horned ten beast. Chapter 13, verse 1 says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns. Now, does that mean that uh, Bill O'Reilly is going to do a story on this monster that rises up out of the Pacific or the Atlantic or the Mediterranean or somewhere? Obviously not. This seven-headed, ten-horned beast is a symbol. Isn't that right? Now, there's a real beast in this world, but it doesn't have seven heads and ten horns. Uh, this is, a, this is a, sim, a symbol. It's symbolic prophecy, trying to teach God's people something, trying to help us understand a secret that he's, un, he's unsealing. He's revealing to us. He's trying to help us understand. I like that name, Secrets Unsealed. That's a good name. God is trying to teach us all kinds of things here. Now, uh, if the beast is obviously a symbol, then what about his mark? Does it make sense that you would have a seven-headed, ten-horned beast that is symbolic, that represents something else, that, that, would, uh, that this beast would enforce a literal, physical mark or microchip or something underneath people's skin in their foreheads and in their hands all over planet Earth. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. So if the beast is symbolic, the mark must be symbolic. Now, I know a lot of people out there uh, in the religious world, you know, they've got all their arguments, they've got all their research, they're, they're researching these publicly traded companies who are developing the technology to put things under people's skin. And there are some companies out there that are doing this. But brothers and sisters, that is not the fulfillment of this prophecy. This prophecy is not talking about some literal thing underneath people's skin. It's a symbol of something that happens inside the mind. Just like the beast is a symbol, so is, so is the mark. Now, uh, this is a short weekend, really. I mean, it may seem long, but it's really not long. It's short, and we don't have time to go into everything uh, I'd, as I'd like to. I've done a lot of research on this. Pastor Bohr, no doubt, has been speaking to you about many of these subjects. I understand you did a series on the three angels' messages some time ago, and, uh, and I'm, I'm sure we're you know, right on the same page when it comes to these things. And when it comes to the topic of the beast, uh, I, I don't have time to go into all the details. Uh, Deborah did mention that I've written a book called Truth Left Behind, and this book documents the same information I'm sure that Pastor Bohr has given you, which basically documents the fact that for over 400 years, Protestant scholars who rose out of the Reformation, who have studied who the beast is of Revelation 13, 1, and who the little horn is of Daniel 7, they have just about unanimously concluded that the beast of prophecy is talking about a system, about an organization, about a, a, a nation that is centered in Italy that is referred to as Vatican City. It's really a country of its own. It has a king of its own. It has its own postal system. Uh, and, it's, and it's filled with, with wonderful people. <laughs> people just like you and people just like me. People, many of them, who are trying to serve God just as best as they can, like we are. And I don't apply this prophecy to the individual people, but I apply it to the system just like Martin Luther did, just like John Wesley did, just like uh, Calvin did, 
And all the great Protestant reformers applied this to the system of the Church of Rome, the Roman Church. And that's a fact of history, and you can just do the research and find out what, what Protestants used to believe about this. Now, go back to the book of Exodus and take a look at chapter 20. Here's where it all comes together. Exodus chapter 20. We've already learned that if, if we keep the Ten Commandments, we won't get the mark. We've learned that if we worship the Creator, we won't get the mark. And the fact is that there's only one, how many did I say? One. There's only one of the big ten, of the Ten Commandments, that specifically talks about the Creator of heaven and earth and the sea and everything in it. Only one. And which one is that? It's number four. That's right. Exodus chapter 20. If you look at verse 8, this is the fourth commandment. Chapter 20, verse 8 starts out by saying, and what's that first word? Remember. remember. And let me ask you, where do you remember? Do you, do you remember in your foot? No, sometimes we can't put our foot in our mouths, can't we? But you remember in your forehead. That's where you remember. And what does the commandment say? What does God say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your, and what's that next word? Work, your work. And let me ask you, with what do you work? You work with your hands, with your hand. So the fourth commandment specifically talks about your forehead and your actions. That's right there in the commandment of God. Verse 10 says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It doesn't say the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews. Alan, is the seventh day the Sabbath of the Jews? No. No. Who is it the Sabbath of? Everybody. It's, the, it's ultimately the Sabbath of the Lord that is for everybody. That's right. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Now, where did we read that? Didn't we read that in Revelation? Didn't we read that in the first angel's message? That says, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. And this verse says, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord, and we'll talk more about this before I'm done, the Lord, who the Lord is, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. He made that a sacred, holy day to honor, to commemorate who he is so that we can have a faith in him as our maker, we can have a relationship with him, and through his power, he can come into our lives and change us and recreate us back into his image in our foreheads and in our actions. That's what it's all about. Now, here I've got a quote I just want to share with you. It's quoted inside uh, Truth Left Behind. It's actually from a catechism. This is a uh, Roman Catholic catechism. It's a very well-known catechism, Geierman's Catechism. And on page 50, this is what it says, quote, uh, what day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So they just come right out and say, uh, Saturday is the Sabbath. Why do we keep Sunday? Because we changed it. We changed the day. Now, there's another quote that I have, and this is from a, a letter that was written by the chancellor of a very famous Catholic cardinal in the 1800s, Cardinal Gibbon. And this is what he says. Of course, the change from Sabbath to Sunday was the act of the Catholic Church. And this act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and her authority in religious matters. So they come right out and they say not only that they changed the Sabbath into Sunday, but they also say that it is a mark of their authority. Basically what they're saying is we changed the law of God, 
we changed the commandment about the creator of heaven and earth, and this proves